Welcome to Chapter 5, Working with Digital Geospatial Data and GIS. What is a GIS? Well, turns out that's a pretty complicated question to answer um, sometimes. A GIS has a lot of components and they all come together to do very specific things and what was once a very cut and dry question has developed quite a bit of ambiguity because of the abundance of web apps that do allow you to do some levels of um, data interrogation and asking questions and solving of spatial puzzles and problems which is sort of what HEIS is supposed to do. So um, it varies from text to text and the verbiage kind of comes and goes um, but it essentially has five components. A GIS is a computer and some software and some spatial data that is then um, put through or processed by some procedures that some analyst or user then um, operates. And so the five parts are the computer, the software, the data, the process, and the user. And it all goes to one outcome, which is to uh, analyze that spatial data and to uh, produce some usable knowledge from it. Uh, it turns out GIS itself isn't quite as easy to label because it doesn't always mean the same thing to everyone. GIS could mean geographic information system. Uh, sometimes people are referring to geographic information science, which is often referred to as GISI. <coughs> but again, that will depend on who you're talking to as to whether that's a critical difference or not. So here we have a, an example of a GIS. Uh, this is a particular one for a county in Ohio. And you have this uh, layout of the county and you can search different things and you can query it and ask uh, to find stuff for you. And so does this meet the threshold of a GIS? Well, clearly it's there's a computer there somewhere. And a user, that's two. Um, there's some software that makes this work, that's three. There's spatial data because we've got a map there with you know reference known places. That's four. And then are we doing some sort of process to analyze something? In this example, we're searching for something specifically. Yeah, it meets the definition of a GIS. So what can a GIS do? Um, GIS is capable of analyzing, capturing, creating, manipulating, storing, and visualizing spatial data. And it turns out spatial data is indeed special and what we're specifically talking about is can we take spatial data and make sense of it? Can we analyze it? Can we go in and take knowledge notes or other information and look at some uh, spatially referenced item and then capture or create uh, new data uh, such as drawing polygons around building footprints or collecting data points with the handheld GPS. Can we manipulate the data? Can we go in and change the size of the polygons? Can we move them? Can we bring things together? Can we divide up putting lots? Do we have the capability of storing this data so that we can retrieve it at a later date for another use? Yeah. Do we have some means of visualizing this so that it's not just stored as numbers in a file, but something that we can actually use and create uh, new things from and show people and learn and visually expect, uh, inspect, and, and make sense out of it? Yes, that's what a GIS does. But all of it is contingent on having spatial data or data that is associated with some form of location or place. So how do we copy or mimic reality in the digital environment? What can we create or display, and how can we do that? Well, let's take a look. The answer number one is very poorly, but we try. Um, turns out uh, the world is an infinitely complex and amazing place. Um, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, there's not too many days go by where I'm not amazed at some level of what I see, hear, or do. And <clears throat> to recreate all of that in a computer environment is a difficult task. And so we typically 
um, recreate aspects of the environment, aspects of reality, and we do so um, for one or two aspects of it well. But when we do that, we often miss um, a great deal of other information. And so as a whole, we really don't do a very good job of mimicking reality in the digital environment. When we talk about what we create or display, it's really just one of two things. It's either a discrete object or a continuous surface. Discrete objects are really easy to explain. They either are or they are not. And I know that might sound overly simplistic, but it's not. If you're walking between the LW building and the LC building, or if you're walking between LR and HEC here on campus, and you start walking on the walk or the steps or the stairs or the concrete or what have you, and you walk directly toward the other building, you're walking on solid ground, solid ground, solid ground, right up until the point that you step off of solid ground and fall into the pond. The moment you're in the pond, you're no longer on the solid ground. That is a discrete object. Solid ground, pond. Not the same thing. Clearly defined, easily identifiable, very different properties, changes abruptly. That's sort of the general way of describing it. And then we have continuous surfaces. Now, if we had an altimeter, something that measures elevation, and we measure the altitude as we come out the door at the, in the ground level of HEC, we could get a value. And we could take a step and get another value, and a step and get another value, right up until the point in time that we stepped over the rail and down and fell into the pond. We could then stand up and hold our altimeter, and assuming it wasn't broken in the fall, we could get an altitude measure there, or elevation measure. We could go out to the middle of the pond and swimming and take measurements the whole way until we got to the other side and crawled up the bank and if we didn't get flopped by a goose we could take measurements there. And the point is elevation is a continuous surface. doesn't matter if we're in the pond, the sidewalk, the steps, or on or in the building. It is just simply a continuous variable that you can measure anywhere and that's what a continuous surface is. The other thing we can talk about is vector and raster data formats. Um, this is the way that we represent things in digital reality or digital environment and vectors are one format. Vectors are points, lines, and polygons. And so this is objects that you can sort of imagine as being 2D shapes. Points and lines are pretty self-explanatory and polygons are any multi-sided feature. Think of things like um, triangle, um, a square, a rectangle, a hexagon, heptagon, septagon, octagon, rhombus, any of these other shapes. And raster, raster is different. Raster is an older, uh, more basic file format. It's basically a giant grid. And for every cell in the grid, you store a variable. So if you just imagine uh, like a tic-tac-toe board, uh, a, a little 3x3 three three grid, 9 squares, Every square would have potentially an X or an O or an A or a C or a D or whatever, but it would have some variable. And when you looked across that surface, um, that's what you would see. Now, the most common format, the most common example we see of rasters are pictures, images. And a cell in a raster corresponds to a pixel in a picture. And in a pixel, we simply have a number that corresponds to a color that we see in that individual pixel cell and then as we get more and more of them the picture becomes um, more clear in its totality and we understand what the image is but while we interpret the image because we read all of those different color changes together the raster format literally on a cell by cell basis gives you the one color that that cell represents and that's how they're primarily different.
So discrete object fixed things, uh, points, lines, and polygons. Here's a really cool way of thinking about it, uh, minus the uh, really complex uh, point markers there. Uh, but lines and polygons are a pretty fair representation of what we see. Um, again, points we use for location, lines um, for boundaries, and polygons for areas or locations 1D and 2D data. Discrete objects, um, I described it earlier as uh, walking off the deck into the water. Another way to think of it would be um, think like a world of digitized shapes of the outlines of things, places and such. So points, lines, and polygons are vector format, vector data. Here we have the football stadium at Youngstown State, which happens to be the alma mater of the author of your textbook. And Youngstown State are the penguins. And there you see the football field, and somebody has created a polygon of the football field. That polygon would be a discrete object. Because it's a polygon, it's in a vector format. Here is another map. This is the Virginia Beach, Virginia National Hydrography Data Set. And so this um, shows basically various uh, line features that represent rivers and streams, along with other areas that indicate uh, specific land covers or water body types, like estuaries and ices and lake ponds and palayas and whatever. Um, this is going to be the bonus question on your quiz next week. What is a palaya? It's basically a prairie pothole, is the one other way that they classically describe them. It's a, it's a depression in an otherwise flat surface that fills up with water when it rains. Palaya, a prairie pothole. Extra credit. Quiz. After spring break. Okay. So, uh, object view is not always the way to view reality in a digital world. Um, raster format, continuous fields, some other things that we can talk about a little bit. Raster, one value per cell. Cells are the same size, it's a grid layout. The best way to visualize is pixels in a digital picture. And here's what I'm talking about. Grids, columns and rows, X and Y axis, however you want to think about it. Fill in the box. And here we go. This is the NCL, the NLCD from 2011, the National Land Cover Data Set. And each classification of land cover has its own color. And this data set is a raster data set. And each individual cell is then classified as, in this example, open water developed, deciduous, mixed, whatever, pasture, cultivated, woodlands. Each of these classifications has its own color scheme. And so you identify the color scheme that meets your need, um, and you can identify those. But if you were to zoom in closely at this data set, what you would find is every pixel on this entire map is one of those colors on that list. Vectors and raster data all contain attributes. And we've talked about it a little bit, but I didn't really explain what an attribute is or how it stores them differently. Vector data is capable of design and, and design for storing multiple attributes. It literally is like an Excel table is the best way to visualize it. And so every row in the table is a feature in the GIS. Every column in the table is an individual variable or attribute. And then every cell, which is where a column and a row meet, that's where you have a piece of data. Or so there's different types of data, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Ratio. Nominal would be things like ID numbers, 
uh, and that sort of stuff. The thing about nominal is it means it's like a name for something. If it's a number, it doesn't really have any uh, specific sequence or meaning to the number. Um, you know, old number 13 was just old number 13. doesn't mean there's a 12. It doesn't mean there's a 14. It doesn't mean it's better than 12 or not as good as 14. It was just called 13. Ordinal data is data that's ranked, high to low, better to worse, but it's not a distance base. It's just ranked. Um, think of it like uh, a Likert scale, where I ask you to rate this class one through five. One being this class was lame. Five being oh my god, I've never thought about the world the way I think about it now. Okay, clearly, in between that, there's various degrees of this class is awesome to this class sucks. But what matters isn't how you would try to do math or something between this, the scales because you can't. You simply know which ones are better than which ones and how they overall rank. Interval data is distance between numbers is significant um, with no fixed zero scale. Uh, and, and what that means is something like the temperature scale. Um, as long as we're not in Kelvin, you can go below zero. Zero happens to be the freezing point of water, so it's not pertinent to the total scale. Ratio data is a number with a fixed non-arbitrary zero. Um, in other words, you can't be less than zero seconds old. You're born and then you age. And so the temperature in degrees Kelvin would be ratio data because zero Kelvin is when all movement ceases and that's when uh, you are as cold as cold could possibly ever be. So what does all that look like? Well, here is an example. This is a ArcMap um, window. We have the um, United States there and then we have a table. The table is the attribute table. And so every cell in the table is a record, every field is a column, and every row is an entry. And so if we look at, for example, Hawaii, Montana, Washington, Maine, North Dakota, South Dakota, each state on the map is its own polygon. It's all part of the same data set, but for each state there's different information what subregion it is, what's the state's abbreviation, what's the population. These are the kind of things that you would see in a vector format for attribute information. Just another example. And another. And another. All that could ultimately go together to give you some final product that would look something more like this, where you would have rivers and and states and whatever. So let's talk for a bit about metadata. Metadata, in all its glory, is simply data about data. It's organized by this uh, federal committee, the FGDC, the Federal Geospatial Data Committee. They determine the standards for content and format. And the reason this is important is you want all the potential GIS software to be able to read the metadata and utilize it and provide it uh, for the people who are utilizing the spatial data. You also want to have the software capable of when you create new spatial data that it generates metadata that meets a standard that is acceptable by the community overall. And so that's what this group goes about doing is creating this standard for what it has to have. So in order to be compliant there are set criteria. And so it must contain a description of the data. What is it of? It must have some accuracy information so that I have an ability to astutely judge whether your data is in fact useful for my intended use. You need to know 
the information on how the data is organized. In other words, how many classes are they coded? What do the codes mean? Uh, think of a land cover data set where you have 16 classes, class 1, class 2, etc. What does class 2 mean? This is the kind of stuff that is often stored in metadata. Here's another big one. Spatial reference information. Turns out um, to take spatial data and actually display it you have to understand um, what the coordinates mean and not to go off too much on a tangent but the way that sort of works is um, at any one location depending on whether it's projected or not and how it's projected and which datum it's in you could have nearly an immeasurable number of potential coordinates that would be correct for that location but only if you knew the other information that goes along with it so to try to explain it just a little bit cleaner if I have data that's in UTM NAT 83 zone 17 north and I give you some numbers that respond to a point coordinate and we map that and then I take um, another data set and I say okay this data set is in uh, State Plain West Virginia North okay not the same as um, NAT 83 zone 17 North different projection if I were to collect those coordinates at that same location I would have a set of numbers just like I did with the previous uh, projection but those numbers wouldn't be the same without a spatial reference all I have is those numbers the software can't interpret what those numbers mean so it doesn't know where to start counting from it doesn't know the units to count by and accordingly it will not place things in the proper locations and so you'll often get a message that says can be displayed but not projected that typically means that you're missing part or all of your spatial reference five you need entity and attribute information you need to have some description about what it is and what it contains and distribution information. Who can I legally share this data with? Are there restrictions on how I can use it? Do I simply need to cite the owner? Or can I only visualize this data? Can I not modify it? Can I not share it? Can I not give it to my brother-in-law if he needs it? These are the sort of things that you would um, make abundantly clear in the distribution information um, section. So, we want to talk a little bit more about some file format issues. Coverages are a really old format. They're almost never used. We're not really even going to talk about them. When you get into the other classes, we'll spend, oh, probably about two and a half, three minutes talking about coverages. And the primary reason is, in all my years of doing GIS, I have only ever come across them as examples in textbooks pretty much nobody has data as coverages anymore however there are a lot of data that's still available as shapefiles shapefiles is another out-of-date file format this one is a vector format it's made uh, of simple files it's a pain in the butt to move there's a program called arc catalog that Esri developed just so we could move the shapefiles around and not screw them up and the reason is shapefiles have about five or six different files and when you move a shapefile you have to move all the files or else once it's moved it will not work and so that's a problem then there's geodatabases geodatabases is an ESRI format to place multiple vector types in a single file with the same spatial information for ease of use and movement it's a means that they developed um, to make this whole process easier to work with and there are three types of geodatabases um, personal uh, which require uh, you have to have Microsoft Access 
You have to have access to access in order to have a personal geodatabase. File geodatabases, which are just large files that have uh, the geodatabase structure within them. And then SDEs, which are these big industrial um, uh, types of, of geodatabases that are designed for um, collaborative enterprise office uh, corporate GIS analysis where multiple people use the same thing, modify the same thing, and potentially could destroy the same thing and so you need to have uh, the ability for multiple people to work and to have what they call versioned editing where you can roll it back to a prior to a prior or previous condition and so they're all um, cool and interesting things. So that's a a bunch of what uh, chapter 5 is all about and again uh, your quiz next week will come from just chapter 5. First quiz covered everything up to date. This one will only be on the chapter 5 material um, and then I'll go over this material again in class um, next week after spring break just to make sure that we all get this before we move further along. So um, hopefully this will uh, work out for everyone. I don't think you probably had too much difficulty with the exam. Um, I'll try to get those graded maybe even over spring break. Uh, but otherwise when we come back um, we'll be in the stretch run. We'll be down to the last eight weeks class and uh, we'll move along nicely and hopefully you guys will enjoy your spring break and we'll pick right back up where we left off um, in two weeks. Have a great break.